Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for our first AI Med Champions Connect meeting of 2021. Um, my name is Alexis May. I'm Director of Content for AI Med. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points before we get started today. Um, this meeting is taking place from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time today. We're going to open with a keynote panel session from our excellent panelists before breaking out into two roundtable discussion groups. You can find more information about these on the roundtables tab on the left hand side of your screen. Um, the meeting will then culminate in an open forum session back here on the main stage. Um, please refer to the agenda for further information. It should be visible towards the bottom of your screen there. Um, in the unlikely uh, event that you have any issues, um, please contact AJ at AIMed.io. Um, now, as you hopefully know, AIMed is the only clinician-led movement dedicated to AI in health and care. Connecting and educating clinicians, healthcare executives, and industry to inspire action and drive forward the deployment of AI. Um, to support this, we've developed the AI Med Champions Connect platform to facilitate communication, collaboration between the key stakeholders involved in the implementation of artificial intelligence in healthcare. Uh, we already have over 100 clinicians, data scientists, and healthcare executives within that ecosystem with established groups, including cardiology, oncology, radiology, and more. Um, we've actually produced a short video um, about this, which we'd like to play now before we get into the discussions today. Do you want to find like-minded clinicians? Do you want to engage with industry and help accelerate the safe and effective adoption of artificial intelligence into the front line of health and care? Then this video is for you. This is Dr. Ashu. He is a pediatric cardiologist at Children's Health Hospital who specializes in cardiac imaging and MRI. This is Anna. She is a pediatric patient at Children's Hospital with congenital heart disease. Dr. Ashu wants to help Anna. However, the clinical solution has to be ported as the ventricular systolic device was made to fit an adult. Often, this implementation is successful, but clinicians want to always be successful. Dr. Ashu wants to understand how we can better leverage existing technology for use in children. He wants to find ways to implement technology that fix problems in adult and pediatric patients. How? The AI Med Champions app is simple and easy. You can be set up and ready to go in a matter of minutes, giving you instant access to the best minds across the globe to share experience, solutions, all at your fingertips. Don't reinvent the wheel. Collaborate with the AI Med community to get solutions faster. In turn, share your innovations, findings, and case studies so that other patients can benefit. The AI Med Champions app community helps shape how these new technologies and innovations get implemented in clinical practice. Contact your AI Med representative to find out more and join this growing global community. Um, so, as per the video, this platform has been designed for you to help accelerate deployment of AI in medicine and healthcare. For anyone who's not already a, a member, the simplest way to sign up for this is to search for AI Med on your app store and sign up through there. Um, that's enough from me um, for now. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Chang um, with our esteemed panel to get things started properly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, welcome everybody from Southern California. So I'm gonna spend just a few minutes and frame um, the discussion today and in the context of mm. our pandemic. And I think it's very, very relevant as a, as a nice um, platform for discussion about um, how artificial intelligence can play a very important role in chronic disease management and population health. So if you look at the pandemic, and I think um, uh, in the area of imaging, and we happen to have uh, a, uh, our CMO friend, Orit from um, Zebra Medical Vision, um, it's been a Cambrian explosion of different types of CNN and looking at radiologic images. And I think that's performed uh, relatively well. Um, the challenge for um, the um, diagnostic kits for testing for the virus has been more on the testing side. But once some AI tools are uh, implemented for testing, such as machine learning, the testing has been very efficient and very expedient. On the um, 
um, therapy side, particularly with uh, decision support. I know um, John uh, Farmkalter from Javion is going to talk about some of the challenges. And it's not so much on the AI side, it's more on the data side, trying to pull data, get data together to get data to be uh, better organized and complete. And um, so it's a nice um, sort of uh, segue into how chronic disease management uh, is going to be managed in the future. And unfortunately, we're going to have probably dozens of millions of Americans that are going to have chronic diseases just from COVID. And um, some of the numbers are very sobering, as you know. And then on the therapy side, I think AI has performed uh, pretty well. Uh, it was part of the vaccine design. And also um, buried in the news was AlphaFold's accomplishment of being able to predict protein uh, tertiary and quaternary structure based on genomic sequencing, which is a sizable milestone um, in, the, in the area of molecular biology. So in, a, in three minutes, I kind of summarized uh, what's been happening with AI in, um, during the pandemic. And I think it's, uh, as um, Arundhati Roy, the author said, um, I think the pandemic is gonna offer us a, a, a portal into a new world and hopefully AI will be a very big part of that um, as we deal with chronic diseases and population health. So we have invited three of the best people I know to take on this uh, discussion, keynote session on how do we deploy AI for chronic disease management at a population health level. So we have this challenge of complex disease we have to manage at the population health. So the, the, the real estate we have to cover in terms of using medical data to improve care is very, very large, as we all know. So I have three wonderful panelists with us this morning. We have first um, Dr. Bill Feaster, who is um, the Chief Health Informatics Officer at Children's Hospital Orange County and who I have the pleasure of working with um, almost uh, every single day and talking about all of this. And he's been a huge supporter of our AI efforts at Chalk, so I want to publicly thank him for that. I know he has the tough part of getting the data ready and uh, for the projects. And next we have Orit from um, Zebra Medical Vision, who is the Chief Medical Officer. What a wonderful job you have as a radiologist and working as a Chief Medical Officer for an imaging company, one of the best in the world. So welcome Orit, and she's um, calling in today from Israel. So we have an international panel as well. And then um, a good friend, John from Turf, who is the Chief Medical Officer at Javion, and who's actually um, been part of AIMED for quite some time now, as well as helping me with um, other academic projects as well. So welcome, all three of you. Thank you. Thanks all right. for having us. So um, first of all, I think, um, as I mentioned, it yeah. seems like imaging and some of the molecular uh, work, AI has been really leveraged pretty at a pretty high level. And I think the, the challenge has been um, dealing with decision support. Um, so John, let's start off with you. What, are, what do you think are the gaps still? And has it been magnified during the pandemic in terms of some of the data issues that you and I talk about all the time in terms of giving us better support? Yeah, well, the pandemic, uh, just from a public health perspective for a moment, definitely exposed that we have a lot of data still that is not shareable. And uh, both at the federal level and, and in the health IT world, people are working to, to make it more shareable with policy legislation. So, I mean, there was, as I understand it, a lot of data still essentially on paper that we need for public health uh, purposes. To, uh, to better manage a the whole population of states and regions and the whole country in a situation like this. And now that it comes to clinical decision support, we're definitely behind in healthcare compared to radiology and imaging. Um, and part of the reason for that is, is uh, it's more in the clinician workflow and mm -hmm. clinicians tend to uh, be a little bit culturally resistant what we're seeing is that there's a, a, both from our training standpoint, I trust my expert opinion, I trust evidence, and there's a new paradigm where I trust something I don't fully understand. And we do it all the time with GPS, we do it with uh, 
with chat bots or, or with um, uh, the, the heads up display in my car, but I don't do it as well as a physician when I'm the expert uh, and now I'm, I'm being uh, prompted to, to think about something that I can't fully explain why it's uh, suggesting I do that. So decision support is one of the, I would say still on the frontier uh, for healthcare. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why. From a data standpoint, um, from a data standpoint, uh, the, the completeness of the data is always a challenge and there are different ways to overcome that, but completeness of the data and, and uh, quality of the data are two of the things that we always wrestle with. And there, and as I said, there are ways to get around that. But, um, but I think the exciting thing though, John, is I think the dividend is gonna be uh, very, very large if we just get the data uh, issues resolved. And I think that's going to be an, an amazing opportunity for us to really raise the game, everyone's game in the data area. So Aura, you don't have to deal with some of the <laughs> decision support data headaches as much, but although radiologists are getting into that space with radiomics, um, what are you doing in Israel? And, and by the way, congratulations to Israel for uh, being outstanding in the area of um, vaccination. It's been really uh, amazing to see your country take that on in such an organized fashion. But I also hear that you have advantages that we don't have here in the States. Um, so what are some of those advantages and how do you, as a radiologist um, practitioner, as well as CMO for a big company in, in medical vision, um, help with the population health issues in Israel? Right. So I'll touch, you touched on several different points. So as far as the vaccines in Israel, we are relying on a really great competitive HMO market that we have four HMO um, um, institutions that cover the entire population. It's universal healthcare and you get to choose one of the four and you get to change every year if you're dissatisfied with your care. Mm -hmm. So there's a competitive marketplace. Um, and so they really need to raise the level of care in order to be competitive. Um, they get paid from the government per patient. And so everyone is trying to do the best they can to retain as many patients as they can. And given that system, they try to add trying to get as many patients as possible. There's really clinics in every little village, in every little corner of our small little state. Um, healthcare has really reached every everywhere. So then vaccinating everyone is not such a complicated process because there's automatic areas where you can just plug it in. Um, and you know, they're used to doing it from the flu vaccine every year. And so it's just ramping it up at a much higher level, um, but we have a reach. We have really community reach throughout the country. So that's with regard to vaccine. Um, I'd like to touch more about population health as you discussed in, the, in your question. Um, and I really feel like this is gonna be a very important, important frontier for AI and imaging um, because most of the data that's out there uh, is data on, on imaging is created for acute processes. Patients come in with particular acute problem, whether it's chest pain or abdominal pain or uh, what follow up with their cancer. And so the radiologist tends to focus on the particular problem at hand. And certainly we're responsible for the entire image. Um, but if you really focus on every little finding of the entire image, the reports would be very, very long and very, very time consuming. So naturally the radiologists tend to kind of ignore things that seem minor or less significant in their eyes. Unfortunately, if you actually look at the data, um, what we're missing is the uh, early phases of chronic diseases. And chronic diseases are actually what cost the world the most amount of money. Um, and if you identify these chronic diseases at an earlier phase, and don't just ignore the data that's handed to you because the imaging is done already, um, we can find these patients at a much earlier phase of their chronic diseases and treat them at that time. And if we're able to do that, then we can avoid the cost and the decreased life expectancy and lower quality of life that these chronic conditions you know, create um, and really, really have the opportunity to help society by really focusing on the data that's being created, but just ignored in the process. So um, do you see that radiologists will be perhaps having knowledge discovery about early sort of signs of a disease that they weren't used to seeing before if they're more involved with population health? Yeah, I think, that's I think what that if we can right? get, 
if we can get the radiology community on board um, and, and really use AI just as a background tool to just yeah. highlight those you know, earlier chronic diseases and just automatically embed them into the reports so that it doesn't slow down the radiologist in any way or yeah. interrupt their workflow in any way, but nevertheless highlight these chronic conditions for the clinician to the, then be able to act upon I really think we can make a dent in, in big big yeah. diseases like cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis and, and really chronic conditions by finding them earlier. Yeah, no, great, great takeaways there, Oris. So Bill, um, you and I have a passion for population health and how important data science is. And I think you are a master at making sure that we don't disrupt our workflow, which I'll also ask John the same question. How do we implement so that these AI tools without uh, raising the, the anxiety level of a clinician that it might um, increase the work burden uh, in the workflow. Bill, we'll go to you first. Okay, thanks for the nice simple question, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, I apologize in advance. I have to uh, keep off of video because of my limited internet bandwidth. Uh, this morning, so it crashes every time I turn my image on. I don't know whether that's meant to be a statement about my image or just a statement about my internet access. So anyway, um, you know, there certainly are all the data issues in terms of developing um, necessary uh, decision support tools, but then the real challenge becomes how do you get those embedded into someone's workflow so that it helps them rather than hinders their their activities. We have a couple of decision support tools now that we've embedded in workflows. One is a little less invasive, which is the display to anyone who's interested of a readmission risk calculation for a patient. And that's used avidly by our care managers uh, and social workers and is it could be viewed if someone wishes uh, by uh, physicians and other providers, nurses, whomever, but the real uh, use of it is, is targeted towards care managers. And that's been very effective and has uh, statistically and substantially reduced both our seven and, uh, and uh, 30 day readmission rates, uh, actually quite a dramatic uh, decrease but it's giving people an extra tool and, and they don't find it intrusive on their workflow. They use it as part of their workflow and they've changed their workflow to accommodate this new piece of information. Um, something a little more intrusive to the providers is the decision support tool we've recently implemented on sepsis when a patient arrives in the emergency department. Um, as soon as the nurse triage uh, triages the patient and signs a form uh, that fires a um, oh, we may have lost his audio. Um, do you want to jump in, John? While yeah, we're sure. Over with Bill. So you're big on. Um, bringing value of clinical AI at the same time, not disrupting workflow um, so that it's a, it's a no brainer for clinicians. How, how do you do that? Yeah. I, and first of all, to, philosophically, two things. One is um, again, this physician or, or clinician reluctance. I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize that because it is such a barrier for people to adopt it. So the, right. the first point is it should be explainable. So when I, uh, when I have decision support, and, uh, and I'm starting to question why it's suggesting that I do this or that. If it, isn't, if it isn't uncovering that black box a little bit and saying, here's some of the reasons why, as a clinician, I'm gonna be more skeptical. So explainability. And then secondly, usability. The reason smartphones spread all like wildfire about, you know, we know the birthday of Apple was what, 2009 or 2010. And we celebrated the 10 year anniversary by what half the world now owning an iPhone. So it, the reason is, is usability, it's spreadability, it's adoptability. So it has to be um, easy for people to use. By that, with a clinician, it's less work. So what does less work look like? Definitely, it's, it's got to be integrated into the workflow whenever possible. So it fits in where I'm doing my work. I'm seeing the right information at the right time, you know, these common five rights in informatics. But then secondly, 
by less work. If I can reduce a care coordinator's phone call time and digging into and talking to a patient from 45 minutes down to 15 minutes, because the AI decision support has pointed me in the right direction, the, the, the care coordinators love it. And we've got, we've got examples and in internal data that we're working to publish that demonstrates exactly that reduction in work time and effort per phone call means they can touch more patients. And then the resulting value, they also see that we're providing direction. So it's not just a patient who's at risk, but these are the things that can be done. It's not just risk stratification. And they really appreciate that. The resulting outcomes, then when they see the data behind it, they embrace it too. And we've had a 50% reduction in avoidable admissions uh, where, where the case managers have touched the population as a as a high water mark, generally we see 25 to 30 percent reduction in avoidable admissions. It's pretty impressive. No, I, I, um, I think the workflow issue, as you said, is going to be key. And, but I do think we're seeing um, clinicians more accepting of AI, especially in radiology and cardiology, and, and then even a year ago. Uh, I see the discussions being very different. I just um, gave a keynote at an AI and healthcare ethics meeting. And one of the points I want to raise with, with all three of you is um, at some point, AI is going to be good enough and agile enough to be incorporated and embedded. And it's going to become sort of standard of care in a way. Um, is it ethical for clinicians to be stubborn and not accept standard of care that might have AI embedded? So that was a whole hour discussion. Uh, and one of the points I always raise is we talk about the ethics of AI in healthcare a lot, as you know, John, especially John and Bill, but we don't talk about the ethics of not using AI in very appropriate situations. So I'm going to be, um, I know it's a tough question to answer, but how do you feel that clinicians should deal with the risks of not incorporating AI in the near future and future and at the same time, justify that. And how do we have them accept that um, it is just as unethical not to use appropriate AI? We'll start with you, Ori, because you're in a more established field of radiology. Are radiologists getting to the point where certain practices are no longer standard of care by not incorporating AI? Right. So... Definitely the conversation has changed just in the last two years. Um, two years ago, I would have to convince people and they would be like, well, it sounds nice in theory, but there's no budget, so we're not going to bother. And now yeah. there's more, we have a budget for AI. We're just trying to decide the best way to utilize it and the best products to try. Um, there are basically three different directions for imaging AI that people are investigating. Uh, one is the triage mechanism where they can just triage the cases to order their work list and get to the more urgent cases first. Uh, the yeah. second is to increase productivity for the radiologists, uh, finding things like lung nodules, for example, things that will make them faster and more accurate. Um, and the third is this uh, whole field of population health and identifying um, findings that are normally typically ignored for the purpose of trying to uh, improve patient care. Those are the three basic directions in AI and imaging and uh, radiologists are trying to find their way through it. But I think the real, it used to be concerned that AI would kind of take over radiology and radiologies were not be necessary. That was very, you know, very infantile and kind of not realistic in any way. But now it's pretty much, understood that radiologists who have AI will ultimately replace those that don't have AI because mm -hmm. increasing the productivity, increasing the safety net, increasing the uh, identification of, of chronic findings are all benefits to radiologists and to healthcare in general. And as soon as we get enough momentum of radiologists really um, um, trying them and understanding the benefit and really incorporating them into their day-to-day -day practice, those radiology groups will just be one step ahead of the ones that don't. And so over time, and particularly in a capitalistic society, um, I'm hoping that the trend will be such that it'll be just obviously required by every group. Yeah, no, I think you would have enjoyed a debate I had with one of those people that said that AI will be replacing radiologists. And I actually said the opposite. I think more, there'll be more interest in image fields like radiology and cardiology because it's gonna be infinitely more fun now with all the possibilities so we'll see john so how do so how do we indoctrinate what aura just said for radiologists now for chronic disease management population health because 
that's where the I think the really really big dividend is going to be in the future. Yeah, I think that there will be a a push pull. By a push pull, I mean a a positive lead forward, and then also the negatives of being left behind. Let me highlight that. We're we're early in producing clinical evidence and publishing. Uh, which drives an evidence-based approach. So we have some best practices evolving right now in using AI and decision support in population health, but those best practices then have to be published and it has to become a standard of care. And at that point, when we have standards of care and evidence-based guidelines that include this sort of insights, then at that point, I don't think there'll be a lot of resistance. Let's look at the corollary. And you take a negative, negative events happen all the time because of unrecognized bias that we have in healthcare. Heuristic, heuristic decision-making is a classic example where clinicians and especially physicians take a very narrow set of data, jump to conclusions. And most of the time they're right, but we don't take into account when we're wrong, especially when it comes to socioeconomic factors that we're not aware of or prejudice that we have towards certain uh, characteristics around individuals. Take a patient who comes in the emergency department. They look and they act like maybe they are addicted to drugs. And so they end up getting treated differently and, they, and a, a crucial diagnosis can be missed at that moment. So the heuristic decision-making is an example where the negatives and the impacts of that will become more exposed as AI is helping to see patients holistically. And that will push us in that direction too, I believe. Bill, are you back with us? Yeah, I'm uh, back with you. I'm, I'm sorry. I uh, no more, lost no you worries. for a little bit. Uh, I want to sort of tag on to that last point, but I wanted to first mention that um, one of the things that we did with our readmission algorithm is we showed the decision making behind it. And this is the reason why the patient is at increased risk. Here are the top six reasons. And uh, people can then see that, hmm, that's right, this patient does have this problem, I better approach that. We don't tell them what to do, we just give them a new set of data they didn't have before. And that, I think that's a key issue for acceptance. Right now, I don't think it's an ethical dilemma that people have about using AI because it's just not available to them. Um, it's just, there isn't much uh, other than uh, what we've kind of plucked into our system. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of stuff out there, and EMRs are not really easy to integrate uh, decision support tools into. You have to you have to go through quite a bit of uh, machinations to get that done. Um, I think where where uh, one of the things that John was kind of alluding to is just people not taking the patient into account, the whole patient into account, focusing early on a diagnosis and maybe missing something because they're concerned about drug abuse or something. I think where decision support tools help out dramatically is that the human being isn't very good at making decisions really with large data sets. They can only handle a fairly small set of data elements, maybe five to seven or eight. Um, But when confronted with hundreds of different data elements, which do you focus on? What's relevant? What's not relevant? People aren't really... Oh, I was just about to, <laughs> it was a, a, such a good point. We uh, lost half of it. John, do you want to pick up where uh, Bill left off in terms of um, how you deal with that situation? Yeah, it's, it is definitely the power of big data that we need to leverage. And that is beyond the human ability to comprehend or to grasp. I can't, I can't process a thousand or 5,000 yeah. features and data points about an individual at the same time, but machine learning can, I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's a given. So what does it do with it is the important question too, and how that's how that's built. Um, and and I'm also uh, thinking, um, John, automation with some of the basics, like Art was saying, you know, um, risk scores. I mean, do we really have to keep you know the clinicians involved in doing risk scores? That should just be automated, or who should be vaccinated and what priority? Um, I don't know what kind of tools you used in Israel, but it seemed like it worked flawlessly. And here we struggled. Um, and people were trying to get ahead of others in, the, in line and it was just a, a, a fiasco, you know? So I think that could have been uh, very, very much helped by leveraging just basic automation tools that you'd be almost embarrassed to call it AI, but it's primitive AI. So 
Um, we have just a, 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 a great question, uh, a few quick good questions from the audience. Um, is there a uh, central app store equivalent where healthcare AI tools and code are shared, either in the US or in Israel? John and Bill and Orit? Well, there are definitely research AI tools that can be uh, more shared, except that mm -hmm. most of the uh, companies are, it's proprietary. I mean, if you want to participate in, you know, having AI in your imaging uh, departments, it's per company. So it's something that we work very hard on and we spend years sometimes on a particular product. And when we perfect it, it's a commercial product that we're trying to sell. Uh, it's yeah. not shared publicly. Yeah. Yeah, in general, this is this is the corollary to uh, evidence-based care guidelines. Uh, the lower value ones are the ones that usually end up getting shared. And there's a public domain or collaborative that's yeah. formed by different entities. And then the organizations all participating send their old stuff. Yeah, it would so, be nice. It's a nice vision, I have to say. If there's an app area for health, even just basic health. Um, and here's um, Bill. Did you? Are you back? Yeah, there's probably. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know where I ended up the last time. It's hard to tell. Um, yeah, no, we um, we certainly collaborate with anyone who wants to collaborate, but we don't commercially publish or make our our algorithms available at this point. Perhaps we should. I'm, you know, I don't think there's any lack of um, places that I could go out and buy uh, tools. Uh, but again, that would be going out and buying tools. It's certainly not. There's no free app store out there that I've seen. Our vendor has developed a lot of solutions, but part of the problem here is just because it's out there doesn't mean it's going to work in your environment. Doesn't yeah. mean it's going to work on your data. I think images are a little more straightforward, but when you deal with different populations with different data sets, um, my uh, readmission algorithm may not work at all on another population of patients. And when we tested that across the very large database, the identified database we have uh, from Cerner, um, we found that our wonderful readmission algorithm, which has a um, you know, a really good AUC for our population of 0.82 uh, on some populations went down as low as 0.5 or guessing, and in others were up to 0.95. Uh, so we're highly predictive, but there was a huge variation between them. So I'm not sure even having a decision support tool that's not developed on your data is going to be fully relevant to your population. Now, last that's, that's actually a bit different with imaging. Uh, we, we have here at Zebra multiple data sources, very large data sources from throughout the world. And, and we actually spent a lot of effort and time collecting such varied data for exactly that reason in order to make an algorithm generalizable and universally, um, you know, universally accepted because you have the appropriate, you know, specificity, sensitivity and false positive and predictive value you need to really have a very, very generalized data set. And so a decision support tool is much more specific for that particular environment, whereas imaging can be more universally um, collected. I'd like or, to add on to that too, Anthony, for just one, one comment. Uh, Bill raised a very important point. Typical and traditional predictive modeling has that inherent weakness in it, that it's trained to the population. Um, because uh, you you end up weighting variables uh, d typically not dynamically but in a fixed way and then also on that population. So I think there's two ways to overcome it. One is uh, a broad representation as uh, Orit described and then secondly different approaches that allow for machine learning to be a little more dynamic and to and to not have one model for any given question but but as many model, models as are needed. And when you have large amounts of data, and we, we, for example, we've got over 30 million patients in our database, and then we have hundreds of models running simultaneously for any given question so that a patient doesn't fit into just one algorithm, but they fit into the one that matches to who they are. That's the way to overcome those barriers around uh, overfitting and yeah. uh, some inherent bias in a, in a smaller data set. Sometimes it's a little bit of a struggle between having a model that generalizes reasonably okay and well, even, and then you try to bring it back to your homogeneous population in a given country. So the, the fitting could be uh, problematic on the other end too, by the way. Um, okay, so 
Yes, uh, last week, I heard a, a really exciting talk at the MIT Feature Compute meeting. They're talking about bringing even deep learning to the microprocessor level, believe it or not, on wearable medical devices. So essentially you're making wearable devices, even basic medical devices have some sort of, you know, pretty sophisticated AI now. So in other words, it's the future is already here. Um, that wearable devices will add yet another deluge of data to population health and chronic disease management, right? As if we don't have uh, complexities already. So the question from the audience is what data streams from outside healthcare, probably he or she meant outside the health system, um, can come in from social media for, um, for instance, for public health AI? And will we see more of the non-health system data used for public health AI? What do you think, or since Israel sounds like you have a reasonable good handle on public health with uh, fewer payers? I love the system of you have to uh, earn your membership the next year, by the way. That's a great system. So how do you, how do you think wearable technology will phase in in Israel? So, so I think that's actually a great environment to test it. And I hope that those companies uh, really uh, entertain the concept, the way the vaccines kind of using us as kind of a, a database, um, because the HMOs are really, really focused on preventative health care. Um, and so every person has their a primary care physician and that manages their care. And that primary care physician has guidelines to get the preventative health care that that patient needs. And so this yeah. very hands-on approach to preventative health care in order to prevent patients getting into the hospital. And if you actually look in Israel, there's a much smaller number of hospital beds in the population compared to the European countries or United States. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we manage with the fewer number of hospitals. Sometimes we don't manage as well. So it can get to an extreme in the middle of the winter and such where you know they count how many hospital beds are left in the country. Um, and so it, I'm not saying we have it down Perfectly, yeah. But the reason we're able to have just a lower percentage of hospital beds for our population is because there is that, that extreme uh, focus on preventative health care. And yes, we're always uh, entertaining new possibilities of how to get more information into the system fed into the same uh, database uh, for the clinicians to be That's able to it, it, get everyone. The dietitians are involved and the you know, yeah. physical therapists are involved and everyone's on the same platform so that the clinician really has a really good overview of what's going on with the patient. We're, we're very envious. <laughs> of it. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes left, John. So give us a short takeaway for um, chronic disease management and AI. I actually think AI and public health is a very powerful dyad we should really explore this decade what, what's a takeaway from you a short takeaway. yeah uh and and teeing off of your your for, former question we have a lot of clinical data already that we're using so it's fascinating to think about how we can use device data to further enhance insights for managing populations and chronic diseases but the big hole is socioeconomic data since yeah. we know social determinants are driving more than 50% of health outcomes in patients. If we don't do a better job of understanding what those social, socioeconomic features are that are actually risks for individual patients, then we're leaving a whole lot of opportunity on the table still. I, I think AI is gonna be good because we're gonna learn a lot about ourselves too, how we look at people and patients. Bill? Absolutely. That's our last yeah, yeah, that was exactly the point I was gonna to make too. Uh, so I agree with Thanks, John. Thanks so much, the Alexa. <laughs> well, this, the whole idea of uh, integrating social determinants. I'll speak for him since I know what he's going to say. That social determinants, which is what we're working on actually at our hospital to incorporate that into um, metrics to measure wellness and not just sickness, but wellness too. So with that, I'm going to thank you, Orit. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bill, for such an enlightening and, and exciting session. And I'm going to hand everything back to Alexis for the roundtable discussions. Alexis. Thanks, Anthony, um, and to our panel as well. Great start to this meeting. Um, yes, as mentioned, we're now going to break out into two roundtable discussions, which will be led by Orit and John, respectively. Um, again, on um, your screen on the left hand side, you'll see a tab for roundtables. You can see the detail there of what um, we propose to cover in those. Just click on join roundtable 
and you'll be there. So um, I'm going to ask John and Orit to head off as well. Um, and I will be back here in about 45 minutes to welcome you back. Um, uh, conscious, we're getting questions through as well. Thank you so much for those. We'll, uh, we'll come back on any that we haven't spoken to um, in, the, in the last part of the meeting. Um, but for now, um, enjoy the round tables. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everybody. We had a really a very robust discussion at both um, roundtable discussions and hope everyone had an uh, opportunity to ask questions or have discussion points. So I'm going to um, use the last um, half hour here to ask our um, faculty to give us um, about three takeaways from today that they really would like to leave um, with, uh, with all of us. So we'll start with um, Orit. Um, I think the main takeaway from the round table is something that we've been speaking about at Zebra for a while, but it really kind of honed in on the fact that you can create a great algorithm as I think that we did, but you really need to create the end-to-end -end workflow to really be able to embed it into a system. Um, and only once you create that end-to-end -end workflow, which we're actively working on uh, at present, only then will you have any chance of having, uh, you know, pervasive you know, acceptability uh, of this type of algorithm. And so we're working on it. The, the problem in the United States, as you well know, there are very different you know, patient, payer, hospital models out there. There's really kind of the whole spectrum of, of how the workflow should be handled. And especially when you're dealing with radiology and cardiology interface, where those two professions don't necessarily always see things the same way, it does make it for challenging. But I am very determined because I think ultimately it's really important for patient care uh, to send these types of algorithms out there and get and have them used to identify patients at an earlier phase of their disease and really improve patient care and decrease cost of the system. So I am determined to make it work. Well, or but I do, as we were discussing at your round table, I do see a great possibility for synergy, not just for a revenue share model, but also to improve patient outcome and expediency of taking care of chronic diseases, as you said. So, um, so I think that I have great hopes for that. And perhaps AI could be the ultimate uh, equalizer to get everyone to the table that, mm -hmm. that and create a new business model that wasn't there before. It just occurred to me when I talked to you, when I was talking to you, that maybe uh, just like other issues like ethics and regulatory and and legal financial business models will have to have a new way of thinking because to accommodate this the speed of the technology and the and how fast it, it's um, changing as well. Mm -hmm. John, you have the harder question in a way. So how do we tackle population health? But I love the fact that Orit is going to bring radiology into all of this. Love it, yes. Tackle, how do we tackle population health in terms yeah. of adopting AI? And I do think we have to be patient. Uh, I think that's one thing. But how, do you, how are you going to take us there? Absolutely. So the, the context, we definitely have, uh, especially in the U.S., we, we do not have the... Um, admirable position of having the lowest value healthcare delivery system. We have the highest cost spend and we're mediocre in terms of quality. So the value imperative is here and that's the context for driving to pop health. We, we recognized and uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a good discussion. We went through a number of questions. I'll, a quick summary is that AI will help us. AI will be a driver of differentiators um, as we move into the pop health space and fee for value world requires that people are evaluated against each other. You're providing value. You're providing more value. You over here are providing less value. AI is going to be a differentiator to help enable value more than just standard processes and uh, evidence-based care. So what does that look like? When we talk about implementation, a very interesting comment was made and was brought up that implementation begets more questions and deeper understanding than we may have we may have realized than we had before. So, clinical decision support as AI is is a journey, and uh, this is one of the takeaways. And, and it's consistent with what we've seen over the last several years too. We start, we deploy, we learn, we ask questions, we dig deeper, and recognize, as you said, Anthony, it requires some patience to say, okay, how do we get to the highest level of maturity in using this? And it doesn't start there; it evolves over time. And the most successful organizations recognize that and they commit to the journey. I think um, 
patients, unfortunately, is something that cardiologists, radiologists don't have enough of sometimes. <laughs> and, um, but I do think the population health, hopefully the journey will re- not only require patients, but mandate that. And I think, um, but the dividend is so big. I, I wish people could really see that. Uh, I think that, um, cause we're talking, it's almost like this is the ultimate final challenge for us is to adopt and not just AI, but the emerging technologies like wearable technology to really make impact. And probably it's a once in a generation opportunity to make impact of this size. So um, I, I think that's going to require uh, patience and also fortitude because it's not gonna be easy to go through the next decade of waiting for that return on the value, but we all need to, to be uh, very, very patient. Um, Bill, you're back. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so we were just wrapping up and talking about um, the major takeaways from today. Um, and we've had a chance to listen in to some of the discussion, but what would you be, what would be your takeaway for um, AI to be adopted into population health and chronic disease management? I know it's a huge topic, but we're just trying to really focus in on, on your one or two takeaways for everybody. Yeah, the um, takeaways to be more effective, we've got to expand our data sources to include currently data that's not available to us in notes and radiology reports and other things. So we, we need to expand that data set so we have a richer data set to create our tools upon because we, you know, just discrete data isn't going to cut it moving forward as we develop more sophisticated tools. So that's one of my concerns that we have to work on. Um, the other thing is, you know, population health workflows are a lot different than clinical care workflows when someone comes into a doctor's office to treat a disease and they're more public health focused or chronic care management focused and trying to apply them across a continuum and making sure there's good communication between all the people providing care uh, to a patient, I think is critical. Uh, We're seeing, you know, we have captated populations that we have to care for and they have their own care management staff and they have their own physicians that are overseeing the care provided to those populations. They have to be uh, fully engaged in our tools as much as the non-capitated population needs to be. The other thing that I was going to mention a little while ago that's very difficult right now, and I sort of started getting into, I saw a little bit of that in John's presentation, is that we are migrating to value-based care, but we're not there yet. And it's only part of our population which creates conflicts um, because while you know we control utilization for someone we have we are capitated for or we're in an environment where we don't get paid fee for service, um, but then we control care and limit uh, the number of visits in a fee for service environment, we're you know reducing revenues. So there's uh, I really wish we'd get there quickly and just get over this uh, this conflict between the two worlds. Uh, fortunately, our administration is pretty uh, knowledgeable and is pretty, um, you know, pretty accepting the fact that I'm reducing their revenues by reducing readmissions. But um, they know that that overall is better quality care. And up till now, until COVID, we've had more than enough patients to take care of. So it hasn't been an issue. Right now, it's a little dicey because we need all the revenue we can get. Um, and need to avoid any expenses that we can avoid. So it's, these are kind of troubling times to be um, over aggressive with, our, you know, with controlling volumes. So let's see if we have any um, questions from the audience before we finish up. Uh, one question earlier was about how do we make that transition from sort of fee for service and not so much value-based care and still adopt everything that we're, we wish would happen with AI. So which is the challenge, right? So if you reduce admissions, 
you reduce revenue to some degree. And John, maybe that's you're you're in, on the front lines of that um, sort of um, financial model, sort of uh, schizophrenia. So how how do you deal with that when you when you approach a hospital and the health system? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, and this is this is the context for for our. Uh, discussion is that the value imperative is here. It's upon us. There's no longer avoiding it. It's essentially when meaningful use came into place uh, in 2009 through the High Tech Act, physicians still had um, a little bit of a wriggle, wiggle room for a couple of years. And then very shortly, they had nowhere to run, essentially. They had to do electronic order entry. Yeah. And uh, so it was like 11, 12, 2013, there was nowhere left to hide. We're almost to that place now with value-based care. Fee-for-service models are going away. That, that from, the, from the policy at the federal level, from the payer positions, that all the payers are looking at how do we drive to value-based care. That imperative is here. And the organizations that don't commit to that path are going to be left behind. So that's context to say, okay, we have to make this transition. What does that look like? And it includes... Once you've got alignment around incentives and the payer payment reform is the big one there, then you have, um, it's or, I'll, I'll call it organizational alignment. And I don't just mean like a health system, but also the extended network of providers, et cetera, where they're working together. Um, you need evidence-based care uh, to be implemented fully. And those things are good, but this is where AI comes in. Enabling AI is gonna be a differentiator and uh, this is one of the points in the, the case that I made for AI is when everybody's in a value-based world, you're all gonna be scored against each other because somebody's giving more value than somebody else. And there will be, in, compared to the fee-for-service world, it's basically participation awards. If you're doing it, you get paid. In the value-based world, you're gonna get paid more if you're giving better value. And so AI is going to be a differentiator to put people in the top tier. And we're seeing that already with uh, our customers that are in value-based contracts, they're leveraging that to be ahead of the curve. You're muted, Anthony. Um, or you're in the, um, outside of radiology in Israel, since you have exposure to the health system there, do you see much AI uh, enabling value, some sort of value-based care in Israel? So it's also in the early phases of adaptation, um, but we have a, a grant with Khalid, which is our biggest health uh, HMO in our country. And they have um, in this grant, put all of our products into their system in order to create that value-based care. Um, and it, again, it's just it, being implemented now, it's in certain hospitals, it's, it's already widely used. Uh, we have algorithms for triaging intracranial hemorrhage and pneumothorax, which are all really, really well received and appreciated. And now we're just branching into the population healthcare uh, with uh, vertebral body compression fractures and osteoporosis, as well as with coronary calcium burden and cardiovascular disease. And they're implementing those uh, algorithms throughout the HMO in order to really provide that value-based care. And what's nice about the Israeli system is since it is only four HMOs and everyone's participating in one of them and it's easily, um, you patients could easily move every year from one to the next. And so it's a real competition to create that value-based care. Um, and it's a really rich environment in order to test our AI and really show the value that it can provide. I'm hoping the United States kind of catches up to that model, um, as John was saying, so that value-based care is really kind of at the front and center of medicine, because that's where it should be. Um, and once that, that is the case, then I, I believe that population health products, whether it's in imaging or in other forms of you know, clinical decision-making, will be front and center to provide the value that, that is really needed in medicine. Well, this is... Um been a, a great um, couple hours, and especially um, given that all four of us are clinicians, which is not always uh, the case, uh, talking about AI and healthcare, what would be your parting words for your clinician colleagues that are listening and will be mm -hmm. listening on recordings about population health and AI? Or we'll start with you since you're not a, a, a guest from um, abroad. Yeah. Um, well, I think that clinicians in general tend to be wary of new things. Uh, not all clinicians are really at the front and center of innovation, 
people tend to avoid change. Uh, there's a lot of inertia in the system. And so I just wanna open their eyes to really test and, and, and practice and learn and read and really be at the forefront uh, of AI because AI is here to stay. And AI can really be a very, very valuable tool in many different ways. But when we're speaking about population health, it could really be extremely innovative. Uh, to really change the face of chronic diseases. I just want clinicians to be open-minded and to uh, really just look at the patients in general in, in the big scheme of population health, not necessarily just look at their own uh, financial reward, but rather put the patient at the front and center of medicine where they belong uh, and really research and then consider adding these types of products into their platforms in order to really advance population health within their setting. So workflow, John, what would be a key concept you'd like to leave your clinician colleagues? Thank you, Anthony. And, uh, and a little bit of the same flavor as Orit had, which is set the bar high. Whatever, whatever you see being done or being offered, especially by your standard electronic uh, health record platform, there's more going on in the space in 2021. And it's very dynamic. So don't be satisfied with what's being offered until you've pushed a little bit on other options uh, and, and, the, and a way to use powerful AI to accelerate your goals in population health. Um, don't, be, don't be satisfied with what's being offered uh, as the, that status quo. There's so much happening. So challenge yourself, challenge the organization, be, be vocal in a positive way uh, to, to explore the boundaries. It's moving very quickly. Yeah. It's an exciting time, isn't it? I always tell my hundred or so summon interns every summer, I'm very envious that they're gonna see this explosion of possibilities and probably a, a real golden era in, in medicine. Bill, how about you? Well, again, the same theme, but uh, I'm, I've been very fortunate to exist in an environment uh, largely created by Anthony and his work where there is uh, increasing awareness of all these technologies and a uh, great deal of openness in our physician community to leveraging these technologies. Um, right now, they're, they're troubled so much by using all the electronic tools we've given them. Um, you know, it, they only see electronic records as making them less efficient and less able to provide care and increasing burnout. And we've got to figure out a way to get beyond that. And I think actually driving for all the data that they're putting into these systems, if we can drive true value back to them for the use of these systems, I, I think we're uh, going to have a much better chance of being successful moving forward. So the more we can do to make their lives better, easier, more efficient by leveraging this technology uh, and showing them good examples of it and integrating those examples skillfully within their workflows, that's kind of the, that's what will make this successful. If we don't do that well, we'll fail. Yeah. Well, like we're um, talking about population health and public health seems like there are a lot of P words today and not to mention the pandemic as well. <laughs> so, so I do look at the pandemic and everyone's had a chance to self-reflect also. I think, um, I think, as I said earlier, I think it is a portal to a new world and we should really rethink about everything in our lives, uh, especially healthcare. Uh, I do think that perhaps three Additional P words would be uh, very good for us to remember. Um, one is um, patience. Uh, I think um, we're in a fast food world with media gratification and social media. Um, and I think particularly the younger generation, I think that the big dividend for AI is um, going to happen if we really are very, very patient to wait for the dividend 10 to 20 years from now. I look at all of the dividends that we talk about will be delivered, but it's going to take a decade or two, not a year or two. So I think we need to be patient. I think um, the second P word I have in mind is perspective. And I think um, this pandemic, for instance, has changed our perspective on how to deliver care better, faster, and um, bring in um, 
data and care from outside the media health system. So I think it's our perspective. And also our, I think our perspective in terms of creating ethical, legal, uh, regulatory and financial models that will be a better fit for the AI, you know, the AI world, which is trying to wrangle its way into the existing structures, but not very successfully. And I think the last P word is patience. We really, patience in terms of the people we take care of, and we're all gonna be patient someday. I was a patient recently, and it is really good to be a patient for clinicians and realize how many deficiencies there are that are still here. Uh, I had excellent doctors and nurses and residents and fellows that took care of me, but you know, they're still carrying their three by five index cards, copying things onto their rec electronic record and instead of spending time at the bedside. <laughs> so so um, I think we do have to think about our patients first and foremost, in terms of how do we bring value and really leverage AI to its fullest capability, which I think we'll see in our, in our lifetime. But you know, the future is not going to arrive here um, passively. We're gonna all have to work hard to see the future and leave an amazing, I think, platform uh, for our younger generation of doctors that are actually inspired by the pandemic. And I don't know if all of you are aware, I don't know what the situation is in Israel, but more students this year will apply to medical schools than ever before. Um, partly inspired by Dr. Fauci um, and um, his celebrity status now being uh, such a champion for uh, population health. I think that's a new generation of doctors that we, we are responsible for leaving a much better platform. I guess that's the last P word and then that would be the last P word, but the platform needs to be really robust and everything that John and Bill and Ora talked about, I think really, really need to be in place for our next generation. I have, I'm raising two young girls, as I told you earlier, they both have an interest in helping um, patients with COVID and being doctors. And I feel even more responsible that we need to have everything in place as good as we can make it for the, for the future generation and population health and chronic disease management, which unfortunately will be even more complex and, and increase in volume due to our pandemic. So with that, um, Alex, Alexis, do you have a, a final um, word for all of us? Um, sure, thanks Anthony. Um, thanks um, to our panel and to everyone for, for joining us today. Um, if you've not already done so, please do sign up to AI Med Champions Connect. Keep the conversation going within the app. Again, the simplest way to do this is to search for AI Med on your app store. Um, alongside our AI Med Champions Connect meetings, um, we conduct a small research project, which this course will continue to fo focus on population health. Um, please do feel free to get in touch with me um, on alexis at AI Med io if you'd like to participate in this project um, on that note i'd like to uh, take the opportunity again to thank our panel for their excellent contributions today um, and thanks to everyone for joining we'll look forward to seeing you for our next ai med champions connect meeting in may which will focus on applications within oncology but for now thanks again thank you Bye, everybody